was amused that the um, we had this exchanges. I can always tell when my editor is not very busy because she answers right away and she keeps talking to me on the email. Um, <laughs> and so today was clearly a down day in her world because um, she she sort of stretched out this long conversation about the, the New York Times had. Um, I, I'm, I'm going in there in their bestseller list that it publishes on Sunday. and um, But they have it as the 14th novel instead of the 13th. And so there was long discussion over whether, whether you know, anyone should actually approach the Times and ask them to straighten it out or whether that was just asking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, eh, it's okay. So I think that we compromised and we took their their image and we photoshopped it so it says 14 13 instead of 14. <laughs> you know, it works for me. Uh, they were just counting the novella as a novel. So, that's okay. um, so I thought what I might do this evening is just read you a small section of the book because I always say nobody wants me to read, do they? And people say, oh, I want you to read. So I, now I'm just not even asking you. So um, if you don't want me to read, tell me and I'll stop. <laughs> um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about Japan, and you saw some pictures. I, those are just to prove that I've been there. So the only or, or know someone who went. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't put any pictures of me on there, but um, but even those, I suppose you could Photoshop it. <laughs> the cherry tree behind you that looks very flat. <laughs> um, but I, th I thought I'd just read this one short section and then um, and then talk a little bit about the travel and whatever comes to mind. And then I'll answer questions and we can go out for a drink if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have to be home. Um, so the only thing you need to know about this, uh, this section that I'm reading, it's always hard to choose a section to read because if you start at the beginning, you sort of figure most people who have sat in the audience have already been leafing through it and they've probably read it and there's not much of a surprise there. <clears throat> On the other hand, you don't want to give something that, you know, that takes 20 minutes to explain and who George is and what they're doing and how, how it, so because I'm lazy, I picked a section that all I have to say is that the only thing you need to know about it is that they need to get to this village by 3 o'clock, uh, at 3 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. So there you go. Oh, and it's in Japan. <laughs> so, um, in the morning we woke as usual to the rhythmic pounding of rice being hulled and the coughs and grumbles of rousing travelers on the other side of the paper walls. Tea came. A tiny sum was paid, thanks given and received. Then, Gaita back on our feet and straw hats on our heads. We resumed our staffs and hit the road, washing for a likely source of breakfast along the way. That was the pattern for our pilgrim time in Japan, four days on an unlikely adventure. We walked until our feet ached, the clatter of our gaita gradually becoming as brisk and sure as all the gaita around us. We hunkered on our heels, we slurped pale tea at roadside tea houses, we sat out rainstorms or plodded, shoulders hunched and feet sodden beneath our oiled paper sheets. I do not think I had a single entirely kosher meal then or the whole time we were in Japan, save those made up of nothing but rice and tea. But the rabbis do not demand starvation of the traveler, and I found I actually enjoyed eels if I didn't think about it too much. <laughs> Moving intimately among the people on foot and on their common forms of transport, we absorbed the rhythm of their lives and the structures of this tight and efficient society <clears throat> and its beauty. The simple elegance of a rundown shed, the meditative quality of a water wheel turning a stream's power into clean rice. Along one stretch, stretch of quiet road, I walked into an adjoining grove of timber bamboo. The smooth green trunks thrusting from the mossy soil were no bigger around than my arm, yet the lacy tops had to be 60 feet over my head. All parts of the giant grass flexed with the slightest breeze, yet it would take a typhoon to flatten them. As I stood mesmerized by the lacy green motion, the rich odor of earth, the endless susuration of flat leaves brushing the sky, it came to me that this country embodied the Chinese doctrine of paradox. The apparently weak prevails over the overtly strong. Soft and yielding will always overcome hard and rigid. 
The days might have been easier had our Japanese been a touch more fluent and we'd been able to read rather than guess at the meanings of signs. <laughs> However, this was an educated land. If there was no eager schoolboy to hand, we, we need only hold out our piece of paper to be escorted down the road in the right direction. Bows came more naturally now as did the slurping of our food, the scrubbing of our backs in public, and the art of sitting on our heels. I caught sight of my face in a looking glass tacked up outside a benjo, the toilets, and for an instant I gaped at the woman with the weird, pale eyes. Mojiro Joku, the place we were headed, we left an address, but then Japan did not seem to have actual addresses, it was a village in the hills, formerly a station on the Kisokaido Road. In the days of the shogun, the traveler would have been guaranteed good lodging and a ready supply of bearers and horses every three or four miles along the way. Since 1911, when the train had, was laid through the valley, things would have changed. As we climbed the Kiso Valley, we saw shuttered shops and ryokans in need of repair as the cold breeze of modernization blew the skirts of the shopkeeper's kimonos. Wednesday night, our last on the road, we scrubbed and soaked with extra care and gave our clothes over to be cleaned. In the morning, we bought new tabi, trimmed our fingernails, restored our rucksacks to order. Holmes submitted to a shave that left him smooth as a baby. When we set up off the road for the last time, we were remarkably presentable. The rainstorm hit us at noon, <laughs> pounding from above, throwing mud from below. We crammed into an inadequate space beneath a fallen tree and cowered under our oiled paper sheets, watching the sky try its best to watch, <clears throat> wash the Kiso Valley into the sea. Eventually, it slowed. We crept up, gazing ruefully down at our formerly white garments. Even Holmes, despite his cat-like ability to avoid muss, was comprehensively spattered. I did not know that Japan went in for mud baths as well, I said. Perhaps we should have kept the new tabby until the last minute. Do you suppose there's an inn nearby? Not one that will permit us to arrive in the village precisely at three. Well, at least there's plenty of water to wash in. The now raging creek was nearly as brown as our garments, but we followed a smaller stream back a distance and found a spring with a calm pool of relatively clean water. And that, is where the bears discovered us. <laughs> <laughs>
And so we, we decided to go to follow the inland one, um, which is the Kiso Kaido. And, and so we, we were driving up, and in, um, you can, there's areas where you can walk along the, the old, it's been restored and you can walk along the trail. Some parts you're on the road, and other parts it has the old trail that they've restored. And uh, at one point we stopped to look at a, um, an old water wheel that had, that had been renovated. And um, you could see the parts moving in the restaurant. It was very interesting. And off behind it was a section of the old uh, post road. So we, we sort of wandered up it for a little bit. And we saw this kind of yellow diamond sign up there, you know, like, they, like a traffic sign, except it was a road that was about this wide and obviously meant for fit, foot traffic. So we wandered up, we saw, and it, was just, it didn't have any writing on it, but it had this kind of black blob in the middle, and we thought, mm. We got closer, we realized that the black blob was a picture of a bear. <laughs> so we got back in the car. <laughs> However, being a writer, you know, I can inflict all kinds of things on my characters. <laughs> really, Mary Russell needs to be a, a bear. So yeah. she, she does. I, I, I will assure you right now, she, she comes out the other side. It's okay. <laughs> this, this is not the final in the series. <laughs> e eaten by a bear in Japan. But I mean, it's a great story, though, isn't it? I mean, if you get eaten, Russell eaten by a bear in Japan. It takes some explaining to do when you get home. But anyway. So, so that's the that's the sort of background. We um, when I when I went um, when I go to some place, and I always uh, I, yeah always I think pretty much always when I am um, interested in writing a book set in some place, I will I will do a certain amount of research about the, the place and especially the time that I'm setting it. And my favorite thing is to have an old Baedeker's Guide. I have this collection of old Baedeker's Guides, which are just genius works because they're, they're not, you know, modern guidebooks, they're definitely written by a committee. And they have all the personal stuff, sort of. You can tell that they're muttering behind their backs, but they, it doesn't make it into print. Not that way in the old ones. In the old Baedeker's, you have things like the, um, the guidebook to, to Palestine that I have. Um, there's a one mention of getting rooms uh, that the local monastery rents rooms and, and for for travelers, and um, and and the comment about these is the divans in the guest room are infested with fleas, <laughs> and, and, and it's just such a personal statement. You you, you, you really feel that this man slept in those very divans. There's no real doubt in your mind. So I, I, was, I was hoping to get something like this for the Japan trip. Because it's nice to, if you're going someplace, to have a guidebook for 1925 or whatever it is, um, since it tells you pretty much what, uh, what that you're seeing would have been there. You know, what, what buildings, what, um, you know, is there a tram line to get around on? Uh, how much would it have cost? What were the circumstances of travel? Um, but in 1924, um, Japan was still very much on the out, uh, outskirts of travel. It was not a tourist destination. Basically, the only people who went there were people who had some kind of job to do, or odds and ends like Russell and Holmes, who were traveling from here to there. So, um, so there, there was not a Baedeker's Guide for a number of years. Did you? Um, there were no real Western style guidebooks for it, but there were a series of um, Japan Railway Association. The railways um, offered you this guidebook, um, which was very helpful because it, could, it gave you an idea of what sorts of things were being catered to in, in, in terms of um, the West. But the, although there's a disadvantage in not having guidebooks, there's a distinct advantage in it being off the beaten path, because it means that anyone who goes there writes a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I found this lovely assortment of books about Japan. Um, I mean, beginning with Isabella Bird, who was a 19th century woman who arrived just in time for the rainy season. <laughs> Everywhere she goes, there's mud. Descriptions of how long it takes to dry her clothes out and how cold she is, and you think, honey, you really should have done a little more research. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Um, but in the in the teens and twenties, uh, there's this assortment of people, and I, I found that there's two two books that I found particularly helpful. One of them is by a woman whose husband was sent there as part of the reconstruction after the great Kanto quake in 1923 that wiped out Tokyo and half of that area. Um, and, and so she goes, she's a young woman, they've only been married, married a while, and she has two children while she's in Japan. Um, so that her concerns are all those of the, the young housewife and mother. They're all setting up a house, hiring servants, the problems of getting good servants in, in these days. Um, this particular concern of, of how to get some, how to convince the, the, the local guy who is in charge of emptying your uh, your benjo tank, your night soil tank, uh, that really in the hot weather it could do with doing more than once a week. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is in the in the warm weather. It's um it's quite a concern of her in these journals that she keeps. On the other end of the of the I've been to Japan uh, collection was a man who who sailed out of Seattle and must have been the early 30s. Um, the, the dates are a little fuzzy, I, probably in his mind too. Um, but he, he leaves Seattle and you get the distinct impression that he had to leave in a kind of hurry by night. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out he's a Bolshevik. So you, you kind of figure he was involved in the, in the wobblies, in the lumber, you know, the, the various labor um, strikes and a lot of violence going on up in the in the lumber mills of uh, Washington State at the time. So he he probably decided the better part of valor was to go off to Japan for a while. But he's fascinating because his whole interest is the working man. So everywhere he goes, he's walking, he's trading labor for um, for you know a room and board. Um, he he hitchhikes with people. He his Japanese is very rudimentary, but obviously, you know, he catches on because nobody speaks English, and so he catches on. And it was fascinating to have this, these two people at opposite ends of the spectrum when it came to their experience in Japan. Um, you know, from my point of view, it's really, really great to have that kind of thing because each of them can give me the sorts of details that um, that you need in a novel and that aren't necessarily in. Um, in guidebooks, so so that's the kind of thing that I do, and I I, I went to the places I wrote about. Um, I went to more of the places than I ended up writing about, but you never know that when you go. So. Um, do you have any questions or comments or things you'd like me to? Uh, clearly, I can rattle on forever if you <laughs> have any questions. I'll just keep talking. But uh, if you have anything in particular you'd like me to talk about, I am I am happy to do so. Did you? Did yeah. you spend all of your time in the rural areas, or did you spend time in the city? When we were in Japan, we, um, no, we, we kind of traded off. We were in uh, Nara and Kyoto and, um, uh, yeah, a number of places, because we were looking at gardens as well as the rural areas. But we did spend, out of the three weeks, probably a week was spent in, in, in more rural areas. We got really lost a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the back, there was, yeah. Um, I have just a question about when you write, because you have two characters, a man and a woman, is it, is it, how do you approach writing as a woman and then writing a male character? Is that difficult or is that, I, I'm just curious about that. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I'm really aware of the tremendous gender needs in, in, in the Russell and Holmes books at least. The other series that I do, one of the other series that I do is Stuyvesant and Gray. And that one follows a man who is very different. I mean, when I, when I, when I write Harris Stuyvesant, I'm very aware that he's manly and he's, you know, fist oriented. And, and you know, since Holmes is cerebral, it's, I mean, although he's good at fisticuffs and does the single stick, whatever a single stick is, um, <laughs> um, he's, he's nonetheless, his approach to, to problems is that of the intellect. And, and it's more difficult for me to write someone whose approach is not that, whose approach is, uh, you know, if he, if he feels threatened, instead of figuring out what it is, he just, you know, puts up his, his dupes. And so it's, in that sense, 
um, you know, that's not a that's not a very female approach to problem solving. So it's it's one of those areas that when I am about to start a Stuyvesant book, I I usually go on a binge read of all the boy writers, <laughs> I, you know, I, and, and Lee Child and Bob Chris, and you know, so pretty soon I'm just so walking with my fist swinging, and, you know, so it's it's. You know, you kind of have to get in a different head place from Mary Russell. But because Russell and Holmes are so very similar by design, I mean, that was, that was, that's who Russell is, is a young female 20th century Sherlock Holmes. Mm -hmm. they, they work in very similar ways. So, um, yeah, there's a question here. Why Japan? Why Japan? Well, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why writers write about places. Um, some of them, because we've been there and we think it would make an interesting setting for a story. Other times, because we really want to go there and we want an excuse to write a story. <laughs> so, you know, because I am not a very deliberate writer, I, I don't outline, I don't, you know, I don't plot out the arc of the series before I, you know, um, I, I'm sure there's some there's some organizing principle in the back of my head that's taking care of that, but I, it doesn't worry me. It, it doesn't worry my pretty little head about it. it, just, it gets so, um, but but what I what I do with this kind of thing is I look at what what I'm tempted by, and I I, I never quite know why. So that when I'm writing a book about Japan, I'm not, I'm not quite sure why I wanted to bring in Henry V, for example. It took me a long time to figure out what, what that play was doing in the book, because just, I, just I just kept thinking about it. You know, I'd be working on Japan and reading about this and writing about that, and, and I kept, you know, it was like a little note in the background that kept popping up, and I couldn't figure out why until I saw the pieces start to, to, to visualize in there, and I thought, ah, I know where this is going. See, I've worked with me long enough, so I can guess what I'm going to do. Um, and, and similarly, I wasn't sure, I knew, I kind of knew that I would like to not set this entire book in 1924, that is, make it a whole flashback. I could have done that, and um, and, and just said, you know, it's out of place, it doesn't matter. Because that's basically what I did with O Jerusalem, it was out of place. But O Jerusalem was then tied to the following book that was published, which has the same characters only in English, so it kind of made sense. Um, but I, I, I wanted to tie it together with where we've got it to 1925 now. <laughs> yeah, what, eight, eight books in 1924? I mean, I was really getting pretty tired of 1924. I've, I've really done 1924 as much as I So with uh, get the end of Garment of Shadows, and they're riding out of Morocco, and it's, yay, 1925, hooray! And now this book is 1924 again. So, so I kind of wanted to explain why why we sort of jump back, and the, but it's still 1925. And so I thought, well, if there is a case that they think is finished, and to all appearances, appearances is finished, but it turns out a year later to be not quite so finished as they thought it was, um, that that would, you know, that would explain the, the time frame, the, the, the two parts of the, of the story. Um, it would also mean that I didn't have to end a book with to be continued, <laughs> which, I, which I did and promised I never would again. Um, but it, it, it sort of was an interesting way of balancing the story. And I, I, I had to work for a while on the, the flavor of Japan as opposed to the flavor of Oxford. I mean, how they are similar and how they are different. And I, and I think that uh, because I, because I didn't want to set it in Sussex, for example, um, which physically is probably more similar to rural Japan, but I, I, there was something about that interesting juxtaposition of Japan and, and Oxford that that it made me happy as I was writing it. I think that that, that that's sort of 
the only the only way you can go if you're a writer is figure out what makes you happy and then you know make make it make it more obvious for the reader. Sometimes people don't get what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> My first drafts are so awful. I just they're so funny because I was talking to the who is she? she's a she's a publicity lady at, at the Random House. At Random House. I was talking to her the other day and trying to explain to her about the book that I'm working on now. I, I could tell she hadn't a clue what I was talking about. <laughs> but I, I'm so spoiled because my editor does. I have an editor who, who, I mean, we speak the same language, which is extraordinary because she's a New Yorker. And I, you know, I mean, we should have, we should both be looking at each other across this chasm saying, what are you talking about? You're Californian. <laughs> but she and I, you know, we, 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 think, we think alike about books. And so when I say, you know, what I'm thinking of doing, um, she'll understand, which is such a blessing. I, if she ever drops dead, I, I'll just have to retire because I don't know. <laughs> Nobody else, no, no editor out there would take my first draft and, and say, oh, that's fine. Every one of them would look at it and say, oh, <laughs> it's too late to get out of this contract. The story had a stroke or something. This is really, really bad. But that's what, you know, my first drafts are, they're short, they're incomplete, they're that none of the characters have any continuity. They're, they're all kind of these two-dimensional cardboard characters walking side by side. I know where it's going. So. Yeah. Where, where are they going next? Can you share that? Well, that's a, that's a sort of two-part question. Where are they going next? Because, um, as I said, Garment of Shadows ends in January of 1925, and Dreaming Spy starts in April, April of 1925. And so we've got, you know, these few months in there. Um, <laughs> that I, I, think, I think they may go to Turkey in the meantime. But the, it's not, that's not the book that I'm working on. The one that I'm working <laughs> on um, is, how, how are we describing it? Um, it's in the world of Russell and Holmes, but with a major twist in the middle. So I will, I will, I will be making announcements about it. Actually, on Sunday. Um, so if you get my newsletter, make sure you open it. Terrible <laughs> 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 Yeah. But um, so that's that, no, that's it. There's, I haven't been to Turkey yet either, so I can't write that book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and but this this other one is um, is it's it's one that's just intriguing me, and I. Again, not sure where it's going, but it'll get there. Yeah. I spent six weeks in Japan as a civilian, mostly in Kyoto, mm -hmm. and I did keep a journal myself. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd throw that in. And, you're, and, <laughs> and you publish it, right? No. <laughs> There's a lovely, lovely book by Oliver Stapler called Japanese Inn that I really recommend to you. You can get a cheap copy on on, on from Egg Books or online. Um, Try and get the one that has a lot of illustrations in it because that's a lot of fun. He he was posted there just after the war and fell in love with the country and fell in love with a particular inn that he um, that he stayed in for a, a number of um, a number of visits and he wrote this novelization of the history of the inn um, following. 30 generations, and I, I forget how many generations, but several hundred years of history of this inn that's on the post road, it's on the Hokkaido road. Um, and it's just fascinating that the, the, um, the, the way he fits together the story of this family, it's a family saga, and it's also the history of Japan. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a lovely, lovely book that if you're at all interested in Japan, I would highly recommend it, Japanese inn. Yeah. Um, this isn't particular to this book, it's your whole series, mm -hmm. but um, I'm completely enamored and intrigued by your character, Mary Russell. Can you talk about what inspired you or you know, anything about Yeah, I think, I think Russell came about when I started writing her in 1987. And my, my daughter was in second grade and my son was off to, to preschool three whole mornings a week. 
Um, and, I, and I sat down and, and wrote. I was 15 when I first met Sherlock Holmes. Um, and it was one of those rare experiences that a writer is occasionally given, where there's, there's not really any doubt about the voice of the person that you're, that you're, you're channeling, as it were. Um, the, the main problem I had was the Beekeeper's Apprentice is, was meant to be the coming of age story of, a, of ex, an extraordinary young mind. Um, a young woman who is, as I said, a, a young female feminist, 20th century version of Sherlock Holmes. Um, and and my, my problem cropped up immediately um, with that first sentence because she meets Sherlock Holmes, and I didn't know anything about Sherlock Holmes. So, <laughs> so you know, I mean, you've re you read The Speckled Band and Hound of the Baskervilles in high school, but I was 35. It's been a while since high school. So, so I went out and I got the, the there's a two volume, I think it's still in print, um, a Dover Editions mass market, the small size paperback, very thick. Teeny, 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 teeny print. I don't think I can read it now. Um, and I and I read my way through the stories, um, and was fascinated by them because you tend to think if you haven't read the stories, you tend to think of Sherlock Holmes as being, you know, this cold-blooded thinking machine. Well, that's the sort of general picture, with, with a very human sidekick uh, who makes the story accessible. <laughs> But in fact, what I found as I was reading those stories is that you have this man who, who hides behind his coldness, who is, in fact, deeply driven by his passion for justice, um, willing to throw himself, body and soul, into um, the, the, the cases that his clients bring him. He sometimes fails and they die. but. He solves the case. What's more important after all? Um, so I, I, I found this um, much more three-dimensional character than I really had anticipated. And I also was extremely pleased to find humor in him, because that I hadn't expected. I mean, you tend to think of Victorians as being very earnest, you know, adventurous. But you find these odd little bits of humor that crop up, and, and you think, was that really a joke, Holmes? <laughs> um, and so, you know, having having immersed myself in the character and in the time and the flavor of the original, um, I could then go forward and sort of adapt my image of Mary Russell to that kind of brain. So that if you take, you know, if you take the brain as an engine, you can use an engine to drive a, you know, drive a water pump or run a one or, or anything like that. It was basically the same engine. And, and this one, instead of being housed in a you know, middle-aged Victorian male, it's housed in a young 20th century female. Um, so I, that, that, was where, that was where I began. And I don't think I was terribly interested in Holmes to begin with. Um, he's sort of the supporting character. He is the paradigm, but he's really only interesting when she's doing something. And I think it isn't until, I don't know, three or four books in that I begin to to suspect that he, there may be two more to this character than, um, than I had suspected, and that I become interested in the development of him as a character. Like, I think probably about three or four books in, you can see me suddenly say, hey, there's, you know, this is. Part of the problem is that Conan Doyle could not see him after the Great War. Uh, um, you know, the last Conan, the last story, the latest story, is set at the very eve of World War One. And as far as Conan Doyle was concerned, there, there was no place for him. This ultimate Victorian male, no place for him in the society that that existed in England after that. And I. I thought this was unfair. I thought that someone with that vigorous and supple a mind would meet the challenge of a, an entirely changed Britain. Um, yes. 
And so that's where, you know, that's where the sort of Holmes side of things comes. But the two of them are, are basically the same, the same person. <laughs> that's my story I'm sticking to. <laughs> what do you think of the uh, PBS portrayal? I mean, the television Holmes has been around lately. Yeah, um, yeah I, haven't, I haven't seen many of the, of the modern ones set in New York, the elementary ones. I've seen a couple of them, but I, um, I, I haven't watched enough of that. I, I'm one of those people who learned how to program their machine three times, and then the fourth time they said, oh, the hell with it. I, you know, <laughs> if I really want it, I'll buy the DVD. So, yeah. um, so it being at 10 o'clock at night, I just pass my bedtime. <laughs> um, but I love, the, I love the BBC ones, the, the, um, the Sherlock ones. I think that they are, the plots are, <laughs> <laughs> the plots leave something to be desired. I kind of wish they paid a little more attention to the machinery of how you write a mystery, and you know, so these gaping holes. It sort of you can push them together without too much trouble. But you know, it's fine. The, the, the characterization is just so good, and the seamless way that they've transferred this madman from the Victorian era into <laughs> modern Britain. It's just it's just so beautiful, and you know the the relationship between him and his Watson um, is just they're so clever um, that I'm I'm willing to forgive holes in the plot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's also extremely decorative. So you writers that you read in the course of your of your research, but is there any are there any writers that you enjoy just for recreation yourself? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I read. I mean, I'm always. I've always got three or four books going. Um, I just finished the the William Gibson one, The Peripheral, which I find really fascinating. I I read a certain amount of science fiction um, because you know when I'm working a mystery all day, I kind of it's sort of like a busman's holiday to pick up a mystery novel, and I I get tired of them. Um, so I read, for just relaxation, I quite often will read something that isn't a, a mystery. Um, and I, 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 I was fascinated with the, with the Gibson book. Have, have you read the... Parts of it, yeah. Um, it's, it took me two runs at it. I, mm. I, had to, I started it and I had to put it down because it was too, my brain wasn't there. But the advantage of having a hardback sitting on your desk is that it sort of keeps saying, 26 bucks. <laughs> 26 bucks. <laughs> Somebody's got to read me. <laughs> and so you know, eventually, eventually, you either give it to the, you know, the library and feel noble, or else you, you, you read it. And so I thought, well, I really I love William Gibson's stuff. And so I, I read it. And the second time, I, I was more oriented to it. And it was fascinating how, you know, just the craft of it is, as a writer looking at how he does it, he never explains stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's all, he's got these two separate worlds. I mean, they're, they're, one is in the near future and one is 70 years after. And so things are all different, but yet slightly the same. Mm -hmm. and, and he doesn't say, and back in 2015, we knew that. He just goes, and you think, how did, how can you do that? How can you tell a story that is just forward motion? And he just will snag a, a, a few facts on the side, to, just enough to keep you going. But it was, I mean, it, as a as a piece of prose that avoids all exposition, um, you know, it's just a lesson in, in perfection. So. And it's also a great story, but you know, that's kind of. At a certain point, that was beside the point. He said something similar when he was here, too. Yeah. He said, you know, I, I don't expect people to read this on the beach, you know, <laughs> that it's much more dense than that. And, and the, the piece that he read, if any of you were here, the piece that he read when he was here, he, he finished and kind of looked up at his audience, and his audience was going, yeah, okay, we kind of get that you're, what you're, you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 As a last thing at night read, it wasn't terribly successful. Yeah. It was one of those where you're actually sitting in a chair. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, but I just, I 
That was really great. Um, I also, uh, I mean, there's a lot of writers that I adore. Um, I, I've been enjoying Dana Stabenow's new series that she's done. She's got a trilogy um, set in the Silk Road um, that is published as e-books and a limited number of papers. Uh, they just, she just, the second one is out. And the third one will be out in the fall. Um, I, one of my favorite books recently was, uh, not recently, but a couple of years ago, was um, Lindsay Fay's Gods of Gotham, which is an absolute superb novel. I think it was the best one I'd read in a couple of years. Um, the premise is day one, cop one, New York City. 1845, the police department is just being formed in New York City, and this is this guy is hired to be a cop or a badge. And it is just beautifully, beautifully done. Um, she then has a couple of those out now. I think her third one is out this summer. She hasn't been here, has she? I don't think so. You should invite her. She's really, really good. So, anyway, there's a couple. Keep you busy. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, how do you go from your first draft to your finished product? <laughs> how do I go from my first draft to the finished thing, the thing that makes sense to other people? <laughs> yeah, my first draft is probably, depends on the book, but you know, three, three to four hundred pages. Um, and it's, it's full of sort of stops and starts. There'll be, you know, a sort of subplot that just disappears. There'll be a person who just sort of walks in and, you know, as if you've known them all along and they haven't been there. And so I suddenly thought, oh, I need that person. And I'll make notes saying, put that person in. And, but, you know, the first draft, I don't go back and do it. Sometimes I will go back and rework a section of a first draft if I need to get it clear in my mind, the sequence of events. But for the most part, I'll just make a note saying, do this, do that, do that. Pretty long series of notes by the end of the thing. But um, but when, when I then give it to my editor, and when I then return and look at it cold, I begin to see the book itself. Because the first draft is not the book. I mean, the first draft is, I tend to underwrite. Um, I, I think more people, especially early novelists, first novelists, tend to overwrite. So they'll come up with something that's 600 pages, it should be 450. I, if, I, if I cut a third from my first draft, I'd have nothing. I'd have a short story. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I tend to write very skeletally and, and decide in the rewrite process what sections of it need um, development and beefing up and where I can allow the story to wander just a bit and then come back. Um, and usually in the rewrite, it's fairly clear. My, my editor and I usually talk about it. It's part of the editorial process. But, which a lot of people don't get now. Um, a lot of people do not get an editor who, who actually edits the book. They, they, they buy the book, they clean it up, and they publish it. And they have somebody like, like my editor who, she, some of my books she's read four and five times. Um, New York editors don't have time to do that anymore, but she does. I don't think she sleeps, I think she does. <laughs> <laughs> It's an interesting process, and anyone who, who whose mind works along the outlining um, in the outlining world, it, you're by all means outline your book um, because it, it saves a lot of stumbling around in the dark. I, in fact, I wrote a book with a friend a few years ago um, called Crime and Thriller Writing, which seems to be almost impossible to get. I mean, I was in touch with Louisa. 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 Yeah. And it's very difficult to order, but they occasionally have it. Um, my friend and I decided to write a book on writing, Crime and Thriller. And um, we gave each other our, our first section. And it turned out, without any kind of planning, she is a devout outliner, and I am a devout not. So <laughs> our, first, our first draft of our first section basically said, she said, well, of course you outline, otherwise you're just not knowing what you're doing. And my first draft said, well, who the hell would outline? You've got to be really anal to do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of looked at each other and said, maybe somewhere 
somewhere in between. And so we came up with, um, she is the organized writer, and I am the organic writer. And but the book is interesting because it talks a lot about the process of you know how she goes about writing uh, writing a novel, and she's all about the outlining and knowing how to get there. I don't I don't do that. So and and I am about how you follow the story to its conclusion. So. Yeah. Um, do you do you ever <coughs> put your book out to? close friends, or do you have a group of people that you want it to read before you send it to your um, Not, not really. Just sometimes, your... sometimes I will if there's if there's sections of it that I'm not that that I need somebody who's an expert. So that, for example, in this book, I I know somebody in Japan who happens to be, um, and, and she did her degree in um, this era of Japan history. And so I, I gave her sections of it, mm-hmm. and she pointed out things like you wouldn't have had fresh fish inland; you you know would have had dried fish. Um, oh, you know a few things like that. Um, I I always um, I always give it to a couple of readers who know the series better than I do. Um, fairly, you know, when when it's still supple enough to be changed, when it's still flexible. Um, because it, quite often, you know, she'll come up with, well, in this book you said that, and so you can't have, and I, I um, as I say, she knows the books much better than I do. <laughs> so, if any of you are on Twitter, um, have you, are you aware that Mary Russell is on Twitter? Mary Russell has a very active Twitter feed. Um, yes, yeah, so she, the, the person who runs the Twitter feed um, is the one that I often ask. <laughs> she, she knows better than I do. So. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah. I have to tell you something funny. I told my class before I was here that I was going to hear one of my favorite authors, and they said, Who is it? And I went blank and I blurted out Mary Russell. <laughs> <laughs> Did any of them know who you're talking about? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's Mary Mary is busy. She lives in Sussex and she's busy. So yeah, she, she allows me to talk to her. So, yeah, it's a funny kind of um, sort of this metafiction relationship because she she gets irate at my getting credit for having written the books and they're being classified as fiction and you know all these things that she just gets very 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 irate about and so that's that's our sort of relationship. Every so often we've done a Lori King. Mary Russell interview. Basically, it boils down to you got some nerve to publish my memoirs as your novels. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, yeah, it's, it's it's a game. I am occasionally asked, um, you know, why why I publish these things in my name when they're clearly her memoirs, and don't I get in trouble for that? Oh, <laughs> So, Laurie, there's one Conan Doyle story, as you know, okay. that Holmes wrote because he got tired of Watson screws it up, and yeah. you know, I should I should do one on my own. Is there? Would you ever have Holmes say, "I I need to write one of these things rather than Mary"? Well, there are sections in a couple of the books that follow Holmes, but they're all third person. Mm-hmm. Um, the only times that you really hear from Holmes um, are, is in the context of um, uh, when he's telling something or you know a letter or that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I the, the the one that I'm still working on, the one that is in the world of Russell and Holmes, but with a major twist. I haven't decided yet how his voice is going to appear because that's part of the twist. Yeah. So it's um, that I, I I'm not even thinking about it until after my tour is finished. I have a few more events and then um, a conference up in Portland next week, and after that I get home and I many things will become clear. Please God. Remember one more. How many of your uh, series do you work on within a year? I do a book a year. 
So one year it's the Russell book, another year it's the Martin. Martin. I haven't done a Martinelli in a while, but yeah, yeah. Or, um, it's it, yes, in that I'm I'm generally only working on a first draft of one at a time. Quite often I'll be writing something and then I will get um, the the copy edit or something like that back from the last one. So I I'll put it aside. I don't tend to have two active projects going at the same time. If I write a short story, um, I, I usually stop what I'm doing, write the story, short story, and go back to it. It's, I find it too difficult to, to change in and out, um, you know, in the course of a day. I I don't know how Ann Perry and Reese Bowen do three years. It's just, I mean, it would make me crazy. Um, and, and, and I, I mean, part partly. I think it's easier if you have a slim book because it's easier to to handle it, but my books tend to get out of hand. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, yeah, as I said, I tend, to do, I tend to do a book a year. I did not have a book out last year, because we had a book out in September, and then instead of having September this last year, 2014, we moved it to February because I'm on my way back to April. So instead of, September, when I started publishing, I was in the spring. And then they moved me to, to September because it seemed a good fit. And um, and then for some reason, in the last five years, they've just started dumping all these huge names in September. And so you, you just can't swim upstream in September. <laughs> so and I, I like April because it's possible to you know to tour a book without being insane. I mean, mm -hmm. September is just <laughs> ungodly in too many parts of the country. <laughs> so. Uh, April is, is it the same process when you edit a book like the complete works of shape of Sherlock Holmes? You stop what you're doing and do that, and then um, you, you mean like the anthologies that we yeah? Did? I mean, no, the anthologies are a different thing because I've um, I, Les Klinger and I have done a couple of anthologies. Um, study a study in Sherlock and um, in the company of Sherlock Holmes, which are a collection of short stories written by other people. And those are, are a long, longer process. But because I'm not actually writing those, it's more a matter of finding time to really think about it when they send them to me, and then I go through and edit them. And most of them, because the writers are so good, they don't require a lot of editorial input. Every so often, there'll be one that clearly they've, they've thought of one thing and then done another, and so you have to say to them, look, this is not making sense. But for the most part, it's a very light burden. All right, thank you.